This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, Harvard! (laughs) All right, it's time for This Week in Virology, episode number 244, recorded on August 2nd, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today, TWIV is back on the road. We are at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and with me is someone who doesn't come on the road very often with TWIV from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Nice to have you, Alan. Yeah, pretty easy drive out. How long does it take? Um, just under two hours. Oh, it's quite a schlep. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, it's... <laughs> I thought it was a half hour, an hour. The drive out wasn't bad at all, but I saw there was an epic backup on the Mass Pike on the way back, so that'll be fun <clears throat> That's for what you'll get. trip. That's what you'll get? I have that to look forward to. I'm glad you could do it. Whenever it's we're, worth it. we're in Boston, we'll make sure to, to call you. Yeah. Uh, we have two guests from uh, the local program today. Uh, our first guest is a professor of medicine and the chief of the division of vaccine research in the Department of Medicine, Dan Baruch. Hi, Vincent. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask you a few things about this vaccine center in a moment, but let's introduce our second guest. He is a PhD candidate here in the Harvard program in virology, and he's in Dan Baruch's laboratory, Jeff Teigler. Hi. Good to be here. Did I get the name right, Tigler? Yes, yes, you did. I practiced it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time optimizing the protocol. Now, this is the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research. We are in the Beth Israel Medical Center, right? And that's affiliated with Harvard Medical School. We are also at the Ragon Institute, right? Or we are part of the Ragon Institute? Affiliate. Affiliated with it. Okay, so the Reagan Institute is a diffuse collection of investigators, right, more or less? Uh, the Reagan Institute is a hub and spokes. So the hub of the Reagan Institute is part of Mass General Hospital, okay. uh, uh, which is also a Harvard teaching hospital. And uh, 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 our, our lab is uh, closely affiliated with the Reagan Institute. And the, what is the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research? Is that your lab, basically? or? Uh, so it's, it comprises about a dozen different uh, labs, uh, of which mine is one. Okay. And uh, it's one of the research divisions within the Department of Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Okay. And I should also mention we have an audience here. Students, a lot of students, postdocs, any postdocs? PIs, string, stringers along? People who walked in off the street? Anybody walk in? That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we appreciate your coming. Uh, before we talk about science, I want to explore how you guys got here today. I want to find out where you're from and, and your uh, educational backgrounds. Dan, you want to start with Jeff? All right. <laughs> Wait, I know you are from Pennsylvania, because I should mention, I saw Jeff last week at ASV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and nice that's to welcome everyone to the area I'm from in central Pennsylvania. Central Pennsylvania. Yeah. So that's where you were born and raised? Uh, I was actually born in Newburyport, just north of... Uh, Boston, but my family moved when I was to, uh, to Altoona, Pennsylvania, which is where I grew up. Uh, okay. Yep. Where did you go to college? So I went to Ursinus College, which is a college about 40 minutes north of Philadelphia. I uh, studied, couldn't decide if I wanted to do biology or chemistry, so I did biochemistry. Um, <laughs> decided it might be fun. Um, and during my time at Ursinus College, I was fortunate enough to do a summer internship in the lab of Bob Doms at the University mm-hmm. of Pennsylvania which is where I really started getting interested in doing virology and uh, science research as a career. Um, so after my time at Ursinus College, I was fortunate to go to Germany for a year in a Fulbright, did more research training, and then decided that science is the career I wanted to do and came to Harvard for graduate school. And it's been great ever since. I understand you're almost done. Hopefully, yeah, soon, soon. <laughs> Whenever you ask a student, I understand you're almost done. They always say hopefully. So. <laughs> You guys know that Alan was a PhD student of mine? Yes, you should know if you listen to TWIV. If you listen to TWIV, yes. Yes, Many years ago. Yeah, there was a lot of hopefully in there. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, Alan Alan, uh, went on to be a science writer. Um, And what's next for you? Do you have any idea? 
uh, I'm pretty sure I want to do a postdoc, an academic style postdoc. Uh, continue doing research, stay in the vaccine sciences on more of the preclinical end, probably trying to understand uh, the mechanisms by which an immune response is generated by a vaccine, uh, which is tangentially related to what I've done my thesis work on, but it's really sort of sparked that interest. And I want to, because similar to I couldn't pick between biology and chemistry, I can't really pick between virology or immunology at this point. So I figure I'll just do both somewhere in between and have fun while doing it. Hopefully. 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 <laughs> All right. Probably. Dan, where are you from? Uh, so, so I grew up in a small town in upstate New York called Potsdam. Uh, was that where the tre some treaty was signed? No, that's in Europe. No, that's Potsdam, Germany. Something didn't FDR <laughs> and uh, didn't FDR go to up there? Um, I don't no. think FDR ever came to Potsdam, okay. New York. At least not when I was uh, growing up there. Okay, is it is it south of Albany or north? It's north of Albany. It's about two hours south of Montreal. Okay, uh, and uh, about two hours northwest of Lake Placid. So we used to go skiing in Lake Placid when I was in high school. And you went to college? So I went to Harvard for college. And, um, and uh, I also majored in biochemistry. You couldn't and decide. When I finished college, I, um, uh, I, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, so I applied to medical school. Uh, but I also knew I wanted to do something before medical school. So uh, I went to uh, live abroad for a couple of years. And so I lived abroad in England. And so during that time, I was a PhD student in Oxford. And uh, I did a PhD in immunology uh, with uh, Andrew McMichael, who was a world famous immunologist uh, for both influenza, HIV, as well as basic immunology. And it's really with Andrew that I started to get interested in the immunology of HIV infection. Um, so this was what year, roughly 90s? Yeah. So uh, it was, uh, so I, I, uh, I got my PhD in immunology in 1995 uh, from, from Andrew's lab. And then after that, then I came back uh, here to Boston to medical school. Uh, and uh, so, so I um, uh, graduated from medical school uh, at Harvard Medical School and uh, then did my clinical training in internal medicine and subspecialty training in infectious disease. So, so, so I'm trained both as a physician and a scientist. And so when I finished my clinical training, then I started my lab in um, uh, HIV research, uh, which was really the intersection of my clinical interests in global health and infectious disease, and my basic research interests in molecular and cellular immunology. And the intersection of those points was uh, um, how I became interested in HIV research. Hmm. Do you still see patients? I do. So I see uh, patients um, uh, for one or two blocks out of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I devote about 90% of my time to research, uh, and then uh, uh, for several blocks of the year, I uh, attend on the infectious disease consult service in the hospitals. Cool. So HIV is your primary research focus. That's true. And making a vaccine, I understand, is, is also one of them. So um, my interest really started with um, uh, HIV immunology, starting from uh, my time in Andrew's lab. And then um, uh, I uh, worked as a postdoc in um, a famous HIV vaccine researcher's lab here at Beth Israel, Norm Letvin. Uh, and with Norm, then I uh, learned a lot of the practical aspects of uh, uh, how to develop and test vaccines. And then when I started my own lab, um, I stayed at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and um, uh, developed a, a lab that was uh, devoted to studying both HIV immunology and uh, vaccine development with the idea that uh, developing a vaccine to HIV uh, would be uh, one of the most important uh, contributions to the global fight against HIV uh, worldwide. On the other hand, it's something that hasn't gone very well for a long time in many efforts, has it? It's uh, an unsolved problem. Right. Uh, currently, there is no vaccine for HIV AIDS. 
uh, and uh, there's nothing that's immediately on the horizon, uh, and so there will be no clinically licensed vaccine uh, for HIV AIDS uh, for the next uh, number of years at a minimum. Right. Um, and uh, I find it a fascinating field because it's not only a great global health need, and if it were possible, would have a major impact on uh, global health and human history, uh, but is also scientifically very intriguing because it has many unsolved scientific problems. Everything from the structure of the virus, structure of individual proteins, uh, all the way to mysteries of uh, viral pathogenesis, uh, to questions of viral evolution and host interactions, uh, let alone uh, immune correlates of protection. So the so polio virus was isolated in 1908, and the first vaccine was 1955, about 50 years. So we're on about 30 years for HIV now. So <coughs> I always thought that it would take less than 50 years for an AIDS vaccine, but maybe not. What do you think? You know, it's hard to tell. There's, there's no way to put a timeline uh, because... Um, uh, fundamentally, in my opinion, there need to be more innovative concepts and uh, uh, more rapid testing of those concepts. As you probably know, in the early days of the HIV epidemic, then as soon as the virus was discovered, there were uh, some predictions uh, made that there would be a vaccine within two years. Uh, clearly, that has turned out to be incorrect. Um, <laughs> There were some vaccines that were being tested within that period of time, uh, but uh, those vaccines ended up not being effective. And it's uh, because uh, HIV, uh, through many aspects of its virology and its life cycle, um, has developed uh, numerous ways to engender viral diversity and immune escape, uh, as well as uh, a lack of knowledge of uh, the appropriate immune correlates of protection uh, has, has really made the development of a prophylactic vaccine against HIV um, uh, unprecedented in terms of complexity uh, in the vaccine field. So in contrast, polio is simple. Three serotypes, no antigenic variation. Antibodies are protective. Antibodies are what do it exactly. And it still, it took 50 years. But of course, those were the early days of virology. And you know, you mentioned someone within, said within two years there'd be an AIDS vaccine. The same thing happened for polio. Early on uh, in the 1900s, someone said there will be a polio vaccine in two years. So people always like to make these proclamations. But I, the way I like to look at it is all the low-hanging fruit has been picked. And what is left is really hard. So you said something that's very interesting. We need more rapid ways to, to test new vaccines. Give us an idea right now, if you have a concept today for a, a vaccine that's not been tested before, what do you have to go through to get it into people? Assuming you've got, a, got good preclinical results. Well, that's starting with, pre, that's what I want to know, how right. long to, to get preclinical and, and eventually get to a phase one. So fundamentally, the reason why vaccine development for HIV takes so long is that uh, there's no correlative protection. So to actually know whether a vaccine works or not, you are required to do very large, very time-consuming, very expensive field trials. You have to wait for people to get infected. Correct. So there is no way of doing a rapid clinical trial uh, that has a marker that can tell you definitively whether the vaccine will work or not. For example, um, there is a substantial amount known about influenza. And so uh, if a new vaccine gives you certain levels of uh, neutralizing antibodies, then uh, the FDA licenses a new flu vaccine every year based on uh, its ability to elicit a particular type of immune response. Uh, we don't have that for HIV. That's similar to the situation with malaria and TB, right? Correct. So in HIV, malaria, TB, and other diseases uh, for which there is not a clear immune correlate protection, then there's no way to prove whether an experimental vaccine will work or not in a short period of time uh, in a small number of individuals. Another counterpoint would be uh, HIV therapeutics, uh, obviously a major contribution to uh, modern medical care and uh, has transformed the lives of millions of HIV patients worldwide. 
Um, but it's very clear that uh, a drug that gives uh, substantial and sustained reductions in plasma viral load in HIV-infected individuals is an effective drug. And uh, the FDA licenses new drugs for HIV based on those uh, so-called surrogate endpoints. Uh, so one can do a trial of a new HIV drug that is sufficient to be convincing that the drug is effective uh, using HIV viral loads uh, as surrogate endpoints. And one does not need to show uh, that uh, there is an, uh, an absence of uh, HIV clinical disease, disease progression. So one can do a trial of a new efficacy uh, a new efficacy trial of an HIV drug in a relatively short period of time in a relatively small number of individuals. For a vaccine, it's a completely different question. So for a vaccine, it will require uh, thousands of individuals um, uh, over uh, on, uh, at, at least a number of years. Uh, the recent uh, uh, vaccine, HIV vaccine efficacy trials that have been reported uh, have been anywhere between uh, 3,000 and 16,000 individuals with anywhere from three to six years of follow-up. And that, that gives you sort of the size and scope of the studies that are needed to determine whether or not a particular vaccine concept will work. I don't know if you remember the first polio vaccine trial. Well, you don't remember it, but you may. <laughs> you may. I don't either, even though I was alive. Um, they had over a million children enrolled. Jonas Salk. Um, and so what you're saying is from that, what they did is they did it during the polio season, and then they looked at the rate uh, by which the controls versus the immunized kids got polio, and they could tell right away that it was effective. And then they measured antibodies in them and showed that certain levels of antibodies correlated. So that, for that trial, that, that established the correlative protection, right, antibody levels. So this is not going to happen with an HIV vaccine until the first one works, right? And then you will have some sense. Or until you discover correlative protection some other way. Correct. So uh, there, um, there have been four HIV vaccine concepts that have been, uh, that, that have completed clinical efficacy testing in humans. Can you tell us the names of those? Sure. So uh, I think the first point that's worth making is that there have only been four concepts of HIV vaccines tested for efficacy in humans. Uh, despite the, the global nature of the epidemic, the vast amount of resources in the field, and the, uh, the, the, the large scientific and clinical focus of the field, uh, there have been very, very few concepts that have actually been tested in humans. Um, in many other fields, there would be at any point in time, dozens of tests of activity of compounds for particular diseases. Uh, for HIV vaccines, there have been very, very few. Uh, and so I think there needs, to be the, uh, there needs to be more shots on goal. Why is that, do you think? So there's, there's, there's many reasons. Uh, some of them are the ones that we highlighted in terms of the complexity, the expense, uh, uh, of, of, of actually conducting these trials, uh, the scientific complexity of developing new concepts, uh, even complexity at the preclinical level of showing that a uh, vaccine has enough preclinical promise for clinical trials, uh, and then the practical aspects of complexities of vaccine manufacturing and regulatory issues uh, for HIV uh, internationally is not uh, trivial either. Uh, also, uh, there, there is... Um, growing, but uh, less uh, pharmaceutical uh, support for HIV vaccines as there is, say, for HIV drugs or many other diseases. Well, if you get a good vaccine, you can only sell it once to a given patient. Depends how good the vaccine is. Yes. <laughs> uh, so for many varied reasons, that is really the intersection of basic science, clinical science, uh, manufacturing, regulatory, uh, practical aspects, uh, funding issues. Uh, then, then there have been uh, very, very few concepts in 30 years that have, been, uh, that have completed clinical efficacy testing. So the first concept uh, uh, was a simple HIV envelope GP120 protein based vaccine. Purified protein. Purified protein that was developed by a company called uh, Vaxgen. And uh, phase three studies were conducted in uh, both the U.S. and Thailand. 
uh, and in 2003, uh, those uh, trials uh, showed no efficacy. Um, and so that led to a concept that the generation of simple antibodies by a monomeric GP120 protein would not be sufficient uh, for an HIV vaccine. Those individuals made antibodies against the envelope? They did, uh, almost universally. So, uh, and there's many reasons why those antibodies may not be optimal. Uh, they may not uh, react against uh, the native trimer spike. Uh, they may only react against laboratory-associated viruses. They may only uh, react against particular strains. They may not have functional neutralizing activity. They may be too narrow in breadth. Uh, so many reasons might be why those antibodies were ineffective. Um, the second concept that was tested uh, was a vector-based vaccine uh, using uh, adenovirus serotype 5 as a vaccine vector. And by a vector, I mean a harmless or attenuated virus that is essentially used as a carrier, that is used to essentially carry HIV antigens into host cells. Because what do viruses do? They're, they're very good at infecting host cells. So uh, a vector is a harmless or attenuated virus, in this case, AD5, uh, that was engineered to express the internal proteins of HIV, in this case, HIV GAG, Paul, and Neff. Um, and uh, this was a vaccine that was developed by the company Merck uh, and was tested in phase 2B efficacy trials in the U.S. And then a study was started in South Africa as well. Uh, and in 2007, we learned that this vaccine also was not effective. Is this the STEP trial? This was called the STEP trial. Now, these internal proteins, were they believed to elicit cellular immune responses? Absolutely. So the goal of this vaccine had nothing to do with antibodies, and the goal of this vaccine was to uh, induce uh, T-cell responses against the internal protein. So I guess this had been determined in animals that, this would, that these proteins would do that. Is that correct? Correct. So it was shown in animals, and in, in the clinical trials, it also was shown that uh, the ad 5 gagpol neff vaccine uh, did, in fact, uh, generate T-cell responses against the encoded antigens, gagpol and neff However, those uh, did not uh, uh, result in protection against uh, infection is in this humans. The, is this the one which actually made people more susceptible because of the ad reactivity? Is that my remembering correctly? Uh, close. Uh, in this vaccine trial, in addition to the vaccine uh, showing no efficacy, uh, there were subgroups uh, in which there was a trend towards more infections in vaccinees than in placebos. Of course, the exact opposite of the goal. Uh, and there's been a lot of intensive research as to why that may or may not have happened. Uh, and uh, obviously, that's something that people want to avoid uh, moving forward. Uh, I should say there is no definitive consensus on the mechanism of why that happened. There are some hypotheses. Uh, however, uh, that's still uh, uh, largely uh, unclear. So you remember we, we did a paper on this on Twitter. Yes. Where I think they thought people who had pre-existing immunity to ad 5 somehow when they were boosted with the vaccine, they had more CD4 cells, which then served as a cell for the virus to replicate in. But it was clearly a, a speculative right. thing. Right. right. I mean, it could even be, it could even be behavioral. There's a phenomenon called risk compensation from the psychological literature where people who think something's been made safer will compensate their behavior. You know, somebody buys a five-star safety rating car and drives faster. Um, it's just one of those weird... Yeah. <laughs> Although in the STEP trial, that trend towards increased acquisition, and I should emphasize it was still only a trend, uh, but the trend towards increased acquisition was seen during the time period of the vaccine trial that was still blinded and randomized. Okay. So at least that period of time is probably not subject to right. the risk compensation. That might um, be something to worry about longer term. Right. So after unblinding, after people know whether they got the vaccine or not, then, 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 then that's a possibility. Um, uh, so the third vaccine concept that was tested is the, the, the most successful efficacy trial in the field so far and essentially gave a marginal but positive result, uh, which was called colloquially the Thai trial uh, because it was a large phase three study that was conducted in Thailand. And the vaccine involved 
uh, two vaccine products, a prime with a canary pox vector called Alvac, which was made by the company Sanofi, followed by a boost with the same AIDS vax GP120 protein that was used in the first concept that we discussed a few minutes ago. Um, and the goal of that vaccine was to induce a balanced cellular and humoral immune response. Um, by conventional assays, uh, the immune response uh, that was induced was relatively modest, uh, leading many investigators in the field not to be too optimistic about the results. And then uh, there was a surprise uh, uh, in the field uh, when the results were announced and uh, the vaccine uh, showed uh, a 31 percent uh, efficacy against uh, blocking acquisition of infection. There were surprise outside the field too. That was, I remember when those results <laughs> came out. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. So one thing that is clear is that uh, our ability to predict the outcome of efficacy trials at this point is relatively modest because vaccine concepts for which there were a lot of enthusiasm uh, had been, ha have subsequently shown not to work and other vaccine concepts for which there was a lot of skepticism uh, ended up uh, performing better. In this Thai trial, I think it's also RV... RV-144 is the official study name. Was there any hint of a correlative protection? So subsequent work um, uh, after the Thai trial results were announced uh, looked at that question in a lot of detail. And there's been uh, quite a bit of um, uh, research in the field on the potential correlates of uh, protection in that study. And uh, there is a statistical correlation between antibodies that are directed against the second variable region, the V2 region of HIV envelope, and a statistical reduction in the acquisition risk. Uh, and so that is a potentially very interesting finding, although at this point uh, we cannot say it's a correlate of, uh, we cannot say it's a mechanism of protection. Uh, the investigators who led that work are very clear that it's a correlate of risk, which is a statistical association. Right, the trial wasn't set up to look at that specific It wasn't set up for that, and one needs more evidence to call that a correlate or certainly a mechanism of protection. It's a hint. But it's certainly a finding that um, uh, was intriguing, uh, that will lead to more research uh, that people will uh, uh, look at in future trials, as well as look at whether uh, antibodies against that region can protect in the preclinical models as well. Uh, uh, so, so at this point, I think it's fair to say that uh, we, do not, we still do not have a, a clear, unifying, definitive correlate of protection for HIV vaccines that can be applicable across platforms. I think everyone would agree with that. All right, that was the third approach, is that right? That's correct. And then the fourth approach uh, that um, uh, has completed efficacy trials is an approach uh, uh, that involves, again, a prime boost approach, priming with DNA vaccines uh, and then boosting with ad 5 uh, vectors. Uh, in this case, the trial included uh, vectors expressing not only gagpol neph but also envelope genes. Uh, and this vaccine also did generate uh, both cellular and humoral immune responses. And uh, just um, uh, two or three months ago, it was announced that uh, that vaccine also did not work, did not show efficacy. So what is your approach? So, um, so there, there are a lot of them. <laughs> All right, yeah, so how are you going to fix this? <laughs> uh, maybe we should uh, uh, ask some questions to Jeff now, and then we can come back to that. Okay. I think the word hopefully may come up again. Yeah, there are a lot of hopefullys probably with that. Hopefully is a good word in the <laughs> HIV vaccine field. What do you do, Jeff? Um, so my projects focus mainly on the question of we observe different types of immune responses that are generated by different types of vaccines by pox virus vectors like Alvac uh, and ones built off of the old smallpox vaccine virus vaccinia or different types of adenoviruses. There are almost 60 different human adenoviruses known and 
depending on what one you use, you get different results when you perform a vaccine study, um, at least in a preclinical model. And so the question I'm interested in, uh, or that has motivated my thesis work, is why is that? And the, the track that uh, I take with that and that Dan uh, was very helpful in sort of guiding me down that path was to look at what happens immediately following vaccination. So there's a set of immune responses, uh, the innate immune response, which are basically the inherent ability of your body to recognize an incoming invader, and then mount an immune response. And so this can take on different flavors. So obviously to attack a bacteria, you want a different type of immune response than you want for a virus, than you want for a parasite, um, and different podcasts to go with those as well. Yeah. Um, but the types of innate immune responses you get back out, that initial response can help determine that type of what comes up later. And so my work focuses on looking at primarily at different types of adenoviruses and looking at, depending on what type of vector or what type of adenovirus you use to build your vector, what happens with the innate immune response that comes back out. And so what we found, uh, and we're able to publish this last year, is that you get quite different types of innate immune responses depending on the type of adenovirus vector you use. And we also were able to figure out that it, at least with the types we looked at, bifurcates depending on what type of cellular receptor the adenovirus vector uses. So just different serotypes of adenovirus, otherwise equivalent, and you get a different... Mm -hmm. They're biologically response. similar, but there's some major biologic differences, such as where they go in the cell once they get in, what receptor they use to attach to the cell. And it looks like those differences in basic biology are influential in determining the type of innate immune response you get back out. Now, whether or not those are responsible or indicative of what happens later on down the road for you know, a year after you vaccinate and you have different types of T-cell responses, uh, we're still not clear what type of connection that is. But at least it shows that the, the differences in vaccine responses you get back out also are made apparent in differences in innate immune responses you get immediately following vaccination. And this happens one day after vaccination. So it's extremely early. So uh, what innate immune responses do you measure? So I look primarily at cytokine responses, um, either in the bloodstream or in, no, in petri dish in vitro models. So in, you uh, do animals, mice, I presume, or guinea um, pigs? Samples from um, preclinical studies in uh, macaque models as well. And so looking primarily at systemic cytokine responses and the, the type or the levels of different ones, there are, you, know, you can look at almost at least 72 cytokines at one given time. And so if you're a fan of drinking from a fire hose, it's a great way to look at innate immune responses. Um, but depending on the classes of different cytokines that come up, interferons that come up, type 1, type 2, different inflammatory markers, you can get a sense of the type of innate immune response that's coming back out, even though you're not sure what cell type in particular is generating them at the time. So when you use human samples, these are presumably from vaccine trials? Um, for the most part, I developed a, a system basically using donor white blood cells in a petri dish and stimulating them with adenoviruses, but they match what you get in uh, the preclinical uh, model in tested in animals. And so we're able then to, one, do experiments a lot faster and see what can happen and also then probe what types of stimulation pathways, what cell types are involved in this, how they work together to generate these responses. Uh, so it's a way of looking at that through a model system. So how do you figure out what kind of response is the best one? That is a tricky question. So there are a couple of answers to that. The first is that the best response is one that should correspond with the type of vector that gives you the best amount of protection. And so I'm normally hesitant to say what's a best response because it's best for what you're trying to vaccinate against. What's good for one might not be good for the other. Um, so for in terms of the HIV vaccines, at least in preclinical models, some with one type of adenoviral vector, the one that actually fortunately showed the more stimulatory phenotype um, in my assays, tends to do better. And so... Which serotype was that? That was uh, 26 and 35. Tend to, those ones tend to do better than AD5, at least in our model. Um, but the, the innate immune responses that we get back out, the highest level of uh, what they're called cytokines, um, those come up with those vectors, but not with the less stimulatory in my assays, um, vector ad 5. And so I'd like to say that's better for the vector, but we don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a long way to walk between those very initial immune responses and something that happens for protection 
years down the line. How much of this, well, I guess with the animal model, um, you've, you've got animals who probably haven't had these viruses before, but in the donor, um, white blood cells, mm -hmm. um, is there any correlation between commonly distributed and less commonly distributed adenoviruses? That so the ones that tend to be less commonly distributed, the, what are called alternative serotype vectors, uh, were developed not because of stimulatory phenotypes, but basically because if you have individuals who already have pre-existing antibodies right. to a vector, it's going to blunt your immune response right. um, from the vector. Um, and so there's no real correlation between what's seroprevalence, so what, how often people are infected with them. It tends to be more basic cellular biology is okay. where the differences occur. So um, this is one of the vectors you were using, right, AD26, and you have published a paper, a phase one trial of a 26-based delivery of envelope, I think, right? So do you have access to these samples? For your work. Um, yeah, and so what was interesting is that we saw these signals in the preclinical model um, in animals, and we saw these signals in human donor cells in the petri dish. And so the obvious question is, does this actually happen in the more relevant, we make fun, human model system? Uh, and yeah, it turns out that you get the same types of cytokine responses in uh, vaccinated individuals. Um, immediately following vaccination, same kinetics. So at day one, comes back down to uh, baseline levels by day three. They look similar types of cytokines. And so it's really representative of the genuine immune response you're getting back out um, following vaccination in people. So are these vectors used for any other uh, antigens aside from HIV that you could compare and say it's antigen independent? So at least with the studies I do, there's no antigen in the vector. We call them an empty vector. So it's okay. basically just the vehicle. Uh, but that some takes of the people in the trials have received. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, it doesn't really matter at what you put in. You can I put see. in, say, leucifrase, GFP. Okay. No matter what sort of the, the transgene you're taking with you with the vector, you get the same type of response. So it's really driven by not the target, but the shuttle. The vector itself. Yeah. yeah. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the serotype makes a difference because for polio, we say yeah, the three serotypes are the same, but if you don't look, I guess, no. you're never gonna find out. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the example I give people usually is that you know, vaccinia and variola are in the same family, but no one would ever think that they do yeah. very similar right. things. Yeah. So your work will help inform what's a good vector to use going forward. That's part of it, right? Hopefully. <laughs> But there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. You don't know, if you don't know the correlates of immunity, you don't know which cytokine profile is gonna correlate with what's gonna be a good vector, right? I mean, I might be speaking a little heresy also, but that it, it might not be that, and I could be totally wrong on this, that depending on the vaccine modality you use, your correlate protection might be different. Like, we don't know. Since we don't know what any correlative protection is, we know it is involved in risk, but what cytokines might be influential or they might just be indicative of something else that's going on that we haven't seen yet. Right. And so it's interesting in that it helps you see what type of immune response you might be getting out from the vector, but the connection between what specific cytokine is happening and the specific type of immune response you get back out, um, we still have to do a lot more work right. to, to figure that out. But I guess that also kind of underscores your point about needing more trials, I mean, it could be that just going to a different vector would change results in some of these approaches. Well, I think what, what we're learning is that uh, for vaccines, the delivery vector is not simply a passive shuttle, mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, the delivery vector uh, has substantial biological properties. Uh, it has adjuvant properties. It enhances the immune response. It has, as Jeff just described in detail, innate stimulating capacities. Um, it has adaptive immune phenotypes. Uh, it is very much um, more than simply a passive shuttle to bring antigens into cells, but very much actively participates in the induction and the maintenance and the triggering of, of uh, responses against the encoded transgenes. It brings its own baggage. Exactly. So, uh, as, and, and just to highlight the points that Jeff made, uh, there are substantial differences among different vaccine vectors, both between classes, such as between pox virus, adenovirus, and other 
vector classes, and even, perhaps a bit more surprisingly, within each vector class. Um, and that uh, is some uh, of the fantastic work that Jeff has both published and is soon to publish, uh, that uh, there's major biological differences um, uh, within the pox virus class and within the adenovirus class with many different uh, versions, subtypes, and serotypes uh, of each one. It's frankly surprising to me that adenoviruses would be so different. They all have the same genes, right? And there's no genes unique to 26 compared to 5, I presume. They use different cellular receptors. So do, you, do all 60 use different receptors? Uh, they fall into different categories. Groups, that's their groups, uh, right? But um, um, uh, there's some adenoviruses that use the, the classic uh, CAR receptor, right. Coxsackievirus adenovirus receptor, such as AD5. Um, other adenoviruses, such as AD35 and AD26, use uh, CD46 receptor. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, there's different tropism. AD5 is uh, liver tropic. Uh, it turns out that's actually not a fiber classic receptor interaction. It actually uses a different uh, pathway to get into uh, liver cells, whereas AD26 and AD35 are not liver tropic. So this is dizzying. You have, let's say, 10 <laughs> different receptors used by ADS. You have to test every one of them in a clinical trial. This, and this, these clinical trials are so difficult, it's, imp it's not possible. You have to make some decisions, right? So how Absolutely. Do you, how do you do that? I could imagine you saying to your group, each of you take a different ad receptor <laughs> binding. Go to a different country. And, and see yeah. who wins and that goes forward, right? It's just stunning to me. I don't know how you can prioritize it. Well, many different vaccine concepts uh, are tried in uh, small animal models, such mm -hmm. as mouse models. Uh, a smaller number of vaccine concepts can be tried in larger animal models, such as macaque models in which we can also uh, look at uh, protection as a readout. And so protection in a preclinical model, although it's very different from humans, um, can be very informative. And then a select number of uh, vaccine candidates are then advanced into human clinical trials. Still, it's pretty daunting, I think. I'm amazed. So I, I think the success of the HIV vaccine enterprise is to some extent going to be related to how good we are at down-selecting and uh, picking uh, what we think are going to be most promising to test, test in humans. Because as you point out, we can only test a, a limited number of vaccine candidates in humans. I think it should be more than four in 30 years. Uh, so hopefully in the next 30 years, we'll be more than four more concepts tested. But it's not going to be hundreds, that's for sure. Now, along a similar line, I mean, we've been talking about HIV as if it's a monolithic thing. But there's also the question of which HIV are you trying to vaccinate against? I mean, are you trying to prevent cases in Africa? Are you trying to prevent cases in the developed world? And we're talking about different strains of virus there too, right? Absolutely. So that's another, another big challenge for HIV vaccine development is the fact that HIV is not a single sequence. It's not like um, uh, smallpox. Variola virus is a single sequence um, for so HIV. Totally, yeah. Uh, there's vast amount of diversity. It's substantially greater than, say, for a global influenza. And you need a, a new influenza vaccine each year, and it's not perfect. Uh, so how are you going to develop an HIV vaccine that can contend with the problem of global di diversity? And there's a, a number of novel approaches that can be conceptualized. Um, um, one can develop immune responses, antibody or T cell immune responses against the very few regions of the virus that are highly conserved. And uh, there are some of those regions, such as the binding site for the HIV receptor, the CD4 binding site. If you could develop a vaccine that generated high titers of neutralizing antibodies against one of the few <coughs> regions of the HIV envelope that uh, need to remain constant for virus to function, then such a vaccine might be very effective against a very large fraction of the viruses. Um, another concept is to generate uh, immune responses that are cross-reactive 
against many viruses or expansion of the uh, immune responses uh, that can then be relevant to many other viruses. So uh, one of the approaches that uh, we have taken together with uh, our collaborators at Los Alamos and other places um, involves uh, using a bioinformatics algorithm to look at HIV diversity worldwide and develop synthetic antigens that uh, can optimize immunologic coverage. And uh, using that approach, then uh, it appears, at least in preclinical models, that uh, there is an improvement in immunologic coverage uh, compared with uh, simple vaccines made from natural viral sequences. And uh, those are some concepts uh, that our group, as well as other groups, are going to be starting to explore in clinical trials starting uh, hopefully next year. Is this something you would deliver by vector? Yes. So uh, these um, uh, synthetic antigens will be delivered uh, both by adenovirus and poxvirus vectors. Mm -hmm. I, I just realized I, I don't know this. Can people get super infected with HIV? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, they, obviously, people who have it don't have immunity, so that's not useful for immune correlates, but it was just popped into my head. That's how you get the, re the circulating recombinant forms right. by right. <clears throat> infection with multiple types. Um, so you published a paper on using ad 26 to vector en envelope, right? This was a phase one. And what's, what's the future of that? Is that going to go further, or is, it, or is that just to test the, uh, the platform? So... Um, uh, we have done a series of uh, phase one clinical trials uh, using uh, AD26 as a potential vaccine vector. And the data to date uh, suggests that it is a safe and immunogenic vector. Uh, and so that is one of the vectors in which we're going to be uh, evaluating uh, these uh, so-called uh, universal antigens, or we call them mosaic antigens, um, uh, hopefully in the near future. And you're also looking at other adenoviruses. I noticed you did a serological survey because you want to make sure people don't have antibodies against these vector candidates, right? So it turns out that individuals that have high titers of antibodies against a vaccine vector um, uh, will have a reduced uh, immune response because those, those antibodies will neutralize the vaccine vector before it can do its job. Um, it turns out low levels of antibodies uh, do not appear to be suppressive, probably because of the higher, high, high dose of vaccine that's used. Um, so, so in terms of adenovirus vaccine vectors, then people are developing adenoviruses from uh, alternative human serotypes, alternative meaning, meaning not AD5, uh, as well as people are developing adenoviruses from uh, chimpanzee or simian uh, adenoviruses which are also being evaluated. Mm. But AD5 it doesn't have a, a good future, you think? Well, there have been two HIV efficacy trials that have used AD5, and uh, those have not worked. Uh, and so uh, it's hard to say what will and will not work, but I do think that future studies will probably have more enthusiasm for using uh, vaccine vectors with different biological properties than AD5. Yeah, I just want to point out this one paper of yours where you looked at um, antibodies to serotypes 5, 26, 35, and 48. So those are some of the adenoviruses you're thinking about using mm -hmm. as vectors. And you would ideally like one that fits all of Jeff's criteria that does good things with cytokine responses and plus it doesn't have high antibody titer in the population, right? This is really a, I mean, it's really tinkering. It's amazing. You don't just, it's not Jonas Salk where he takes polio and sticks it in people and it works. <laughs> right? Well, if we take one step back and yeah. look at the, the big picture of, of uh, where we are with HIV vaccines, then, then in the early days of the HIV epidemic, all of the classical vaccination strategies for HIV had been tried. Right. And typically, they involve either the generation of a live attenuated pathogen, a whole killed pathogen, or a recombinant protein subunit. And those three strategies account for all currently, current clinically licensed vaccines, obviously with variations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and for many different reasons, uh, those three strategies either are believed to be too unsafe for an HIV vaccine, not effective for an HIV vaccine, or otherwise not uh, feasible, at least with currently available technologies. Well, also, all of those classical technologies um, are, are kind of predicated on the concept that infection is protective. That people, are, that people who are infected, I mean, all the classical vaccines are against viruses where you get them once. Um, the antibodies are protective, and all of those technologies accomplish that. Um, so in the case of HIV, I mean, you're, you're looking at technologies that were built for a sort of a different type of threat. Absolutely. And so as a result of the challenges that clearly are posed by all of the classical vaccination technologies in the case of HIV, then uh, the focus, the primary focus in the HIV vaccine field is uh, on developing new technologies such as vector technologies, such as protein engineering technologies, um, and other uh, types of uh, vaccine strategies. Which, work, which is what worked the previous time around with vaccines, too. I mean, you say Jonas Salk taking the virus and killing it and injecting it, but that didn't happen for 50 years after the virus was discovered because yeah, the technologies yeah. didn't exist to do it. Well, that and we didn't know there were three serotypes. Right. There was, we didn't know the There was basic virology that yeah, needed to be done right. and immunology that needed to be done and also fundamental technologies. And I think we're at the same point just a century later. That brings up a good point that, at least from my perspective, having not started in HIV but learned the field as I've gone along my PhD, is that it seems that the more we learn about HIV, the more we learn that we don't know how to do yet. <laughs> And so it's, I think that's a very good point that we're still at the stage where we're learning a lot about not just the virus, but also how do you elicit these different types of immune responses that we've already, as was mentioned before, had the, pick the low hanging fruit. And so right. now we need to figure out how to do things differently um, to combat this and other types of pathogens that we don't really have vaccines against yet. It may be that hep C presents not the same, but similar challenges for a vaccine because there is also great variation, right? Well, I think it's probably going to be a lot of things that will follow a similar pattern. If you get the technologies to, to develop an HIV vaccine, you may find that they're going to be useful in developing vaccines against other things, because we have a lot of diseases that are yeah. in some ways like this. Like Teflon. Teflon is a disease now? <laughs> no, Teflon was a, a byproduct of the space program. Oh, yes, right. I thought it was a vaccine. <laughs> well, it's a good name. You might want to name one. Antibodies of your do not stick to so it. So I'm thinking it's very you, difficult. all of these uh, experimental HIV vaccines have been injected, right? But, uh, and that is, if you're an IV drug user, that's how you would acquire infection. But there are also infections acquired, acquired at mucosal surfaces. So is there a way to target those surfaces with immunity? Yeah, that's a very good question uh, because. Um, uh, the vast majority of HIV infections worldwide are transmitted by mucosal surfaces. So an HIV vaccine that will have a global public health impact will have to contend with uh, mucosal challenges. Uh, so so it, it turns out that, that a variety of vector technologies actually, uh, even when injected intramuscularly, can raise uh, mucosal antibody and T cell responses. Uh, our group and others have shown that in preclinical models, uh, as well as uh, now in clinical trials in humans. So we know that uh, intramuscular immunization actually is a, a fairly efficient way of inducing mucosal immunity. It is somewhat heretical uh, if in, because in immunology textbooks, there is often a distinction between the systemic immune response and the mucosal immune response. And um, uh, it, we, we believe that uh, shortly after vaccination, the inflammatory properties of the vaccination, including the innate response to the vaccine vector, which uh, Jeff described to you, uh, actually can promote uh, expression of molecules on T cells that, that encourage mucosal homing. So there is a mechanism by which we think uh, for particular types of vaccine vectors, uh, we do get uh, 
uh, antibody and T-cell responses at mucosal surfaces, even after an intramuscular vaccination. However, other vaccine technologies are actually not uh, only injected intramuscularly. There's different uh, experimental vaccines that are being delivered mucosally, either orally through tablets or capsules, and enteric-coated capsules, um, uh, intranasal sprays, uh, and other, uh, uh, other strategies. Well, we had um, Judy Lieberman on TWIV 140, who's also here at Harvard, um, working with aptamers in, in an approach along those lines. Um, that's one of many, as you say. Is a this, is a, this was an issue in, in the inactivated polio vaccine, which historically has not given good, so that's injected intramuscularly. This was Salk's vaccine. It does not give good mucosal immunity. And as a consequence, the intestines of individuals in countries that use that vaccine can still be infected with polio virus. They can shed the virus and it can be passed from person to person. So that's why here in the US where we use exclusively IPV, that's why I think there is circulation of wild polio strains. And these strains in, in the sewers of Israel, which were just detected, are probably there because they use IPV in that country and their guts are susceptible. So there may be something similar going on with flu vaccine as well. It turns out flu mist is actually much more protective in kids than the injected vaccine in, in adults, maybe not so, but it could have to do with building up the mucosal rather than. But if you give people Sabin vaccine, which you ingest and replicates in your gut, then you get wonderful gut immunity. That's why, so even though maybe some vaccines work in the, at the mucosal level after I am, it hasn't been uh, the, the, the uh, case with polio. Mm -hmm. so. The other thing is uh, potentially not just the route of delivery of the vaccine, but also whether the vaccine itself replicates. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So with the Sabin polio vaccine, uh, then uh, it, it is likely that the replication of the vaccine strain is uh, critical for right. engendering the broadest and most potent uh, host response. You know, years ago, people were thinking of using Sabin as a carrier for envelope of HIV, but nothing ever came of that. I believe that uh, poliovirus, uh, th there are some publications in the literature using poliovirus as a vaccine vector. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, it, as, as you know better than anyone, poliovirus is such a compact genome that uh, there's not much space to encode right. large transgenes. And so for tactical reasons, then uh, it, it, it's not terribly useful for that reason. Yeah, it's a rather compact capsid. You can't put much more. Right. And it's the same with ADD, right? You can't put more than 10%, I think. Is that right? Is that the number into the capsid? It's also an icosahedral capsid. But that's enough because the genome is bigger. So the strategy for ADD is that there's some genes that are dispensable that can be deleted, yeah. that can essentially make the room you need. So these are the gutless constructs. Is that where you take most of the genome out, or are you talking about a different... It's not the gutless construct. So most of the adenovirus vaccine vectors are, have two regions deleted, one region that's called E1, which has the dual purpose of uh, both creating more space to put a transgene, but also uh, that's the region for replication. And most of the vaccines are made to be replication incompetent uh, f to enhance safety, uh, which is, of course, uh, the most important thing with vaccine trials is to ensure the vaccine product is safe. Right. Uh, and then the second region that appears to be at least largely dispensable is the E3 region of adeno. Uh, and so E1 and E3 deletions uh, uh, generally give sufficient space to put in a transgene of interest. So are, are you betting on adenovirus vectors for HIV, or do you have other things that you're exploring as well? Uh, we're, we're definitely exploring uh, many different pathways. Uh, our AD26 uh, vectors are advancing most rapidly, and they're the furthest along in terms of clinical development and clinical trials. Uh, and they do look promising, at least so far. Uh, however, we're very interested in using a pox virus called mm -hmm. MVA, mm -hmm. potentially as a boost. Uh, and there's preclinical data showing that combining adenovirus and pox virus vectors is a very effective way of boosting immune responses. And we also have a strong interest in uh, uh, purified protein immunogens, uh, particularly uh, using uh, HIV envelope trimers uh, rather than what is gone before us, which is uh, simple uh, GP120 monomers. As you know, on the HIV surface, uh, the envelope protein exists naturally as a trimer spike. 
And so our hypothesis is that a well-formed trimer uh, might be more effective at inducing the appropriate types of antibody responses than a, a simple monomeric uh, component of that. Right. I, I want to point out also, this is a totally different topic, but somewhat related, that we had done a, a digression on TWIV? <laughs> Um, I had to get rid of stumps in the front. <laughs> um, it was a paper we actually did on TWIV 204, and uh, you were an author on that paper, and that is this observation. Do you remember that in, in monkeys infected with SIV, there's an expansion of the gut virome? Yes. Do you remember? Yes. Well, Dan here was That's one right. of the authors of that study, and uh, we were talking about it today. Uh, because the observation is that uh, rhesus monkeys, right, with, with SIV have more viruses in their gut tracts than their uh, cohorts that are not infected. Yes, so that's a study that uh, our group uh, published in collaboration with Skip Virgin's group at WashU together with other collaborators as well. And in that study, then, we observe that um, in rhesus macaques, uh, with progressive SIV and progressive AIDS disease, uh, there was a major expansion of the so-called virome, which is the numbers and types of viruses uh, in the intestinal tract. And we hypothesized that uh, that was directly correlated with uh, intestinal damage and chronic immune activation, which is the hallmark for progressive AIDS. Uh, so uh, although those results still are still need to be confirmed in humans, then at least in the animal model, it appears that um, expansion of the gut virome uh, is uh, at least correlated with uh, progressive AIDS disease and might actually be a critical uh, part of uh, AIDS disease pathogenesis. And the, the other interesting aspect is that you discovered brand new viruses in that study. Right. Yeah, so in the context of that study, then uh, uh, we identified dozens of novel viruses, uh, really of all classes, uh, dozens of novel simian adenoviruses, picornaviruses, um, uh, adeno-associated viruses, uh, and many other viruses as well. Is, I assume somebody's doing that in people now, that, that work. Uh, people are uh, studying uh, the uh, gut virome right. in HIV-infected individuals now. Care to make any speculations about the outcome? I suspect it's going to be different between people who are on antivirals and those who aren't. Yeah. Beyond that, I'm not going to speculate a whole lot. <laughs> Notice I said different, not... Uh... Yeah. Um, that's a good point. I, I, I guess you would want to have some individuals who are not on antiviral therapy for that, right? Because that in those individuals with antivirals, the immunosuppression will Which be. may be tough to ethically enroll in a trial. This is the man to tell you if you could do right. that or not. Or you could get them right when they enroll. So, I mean, one, um, so physicians always see patients uh, who have HIV infection who, at the time of diagnosis, of course, are not on antiviral therapy at that point in time. Right. So one could uh, look at the virome in those individuals yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, as well as potentially uh, after they're put on therapy right. and then suppress virus and then you get whether those the same changes patient. might go away. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to the result of that study. It'll be really interesting, not just because it's in terms of AIDS enteropathy, it's interesting, but new viruses and people are always interested. I'll in make it. another prediction about that study. I know. It we'll talk about it on TWIV. We will. <laughs> I thought you were going to say they will find new viruses. <laughs> yes, that too. Some predictions are easy to make. Um, <laughs> and the human virome is really not appreciated, as we were discussing today. The microbiome, people think of bacteria, right? But viruses are part of it. And uh, they put this through a 0.45 micron filter and keep what's on the filter when they do these microbiome, right. and that gets rid of most of the viruses. Right. So I'm really looking forward to that. So if there are probiotics that people are, are hawking now to balance out your intestinal bacteria, should we, should we start coming up with some, uh, yeah. some marketing materials? I think we should start a company. Proviromics. Proviromics, Prover give it a fancy name. You know, speaking of probiotics, it's a real digression, but you, you're going to like this. I, I did a paper on TWIM yesterday. There is a strain of E. coli. It's called the Nissel strain. It was isolated in 1917 
from a soldier who didn't get gastroenteritis during a Shigella outbreak. And this is used as a probiotic strain. It's considered to be beneficial. And I, we did a paper where they show the reason, it, it can actually, in a mouse model, inhibit colonization by Salmonella because it sequesters iron. And you know bacteria need iron to grow. And um, the E. coli has a better way of taking iron from, and so it is actually a real mechanism of being a probiotic, the only one I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> right? My, co, my co-host, uh, Elio Schechter, when I said this paper on probiotics, he said, no, nah, I know probiotics, but he, it turns out it's really good. So that's the first example. But yeah, vi- the viruses will probably turn out to be beneficial, at least some of them. Why would they be there otherwise, right? Well, we're not supposed to ask why questions, are we? What is their function? <laughs> <laughs> could we read a couple of uh, Yeah, we emails? could do a couple of emails. Do emails and pics. I have one here from Annie. Is Annie in the audience? No. You said no, but how would you know? <laughs> uh, Annie writes, I'm glad that my email amused you when you read it during TWIP 57. I'm thrilled that you will be at Beth Israel on August 2nd. If I can get my night shift covered, I will worm my way into Boston and crash the podcast. If not, mm-hmm. I will catch it when, it's, when it airs. My daughter Caroline will be in the audience. Car- Is she here? Hey! Am I embarrassing you by reading this? <laughs> I hope not. You know, millions of people will hear it. Hi, Caroline. <laughs> After three productive years with Dr. Dolan and Dr. Seaman, she is heading to medical school where I hope she will encounter many viruses, microbes, and parasites. Not personally, <laughs> right? My job as a mother is complete. No, that's not true, actually. I can tell you. You and Dr. Depommier have a loyal following at CVS Pharmacy. With great fondness and admiration, Annie. Cool. Uh, say hi to your mom, okay? <laughs> and we miss her. So she wrote a letter to TWIP, and she said she, she does the night shift at CVS, and she listens to our podcast. Isn't that great? Yeah. How cool is that? And congratulations, by the way. Yes. Oh, you want to take the next one sure. from Robin? Uh, Robin writes, uh, zoonotic? Oh, yeah, zoonotic. A difference between uh, zoonotic, two different definitions, origin... Zoonotic origin came as a pathogen from animals once upon a time, not those that came uh, non-pathogenic to humans from animals and later became pathogenic in humans. Versus zoonotic transmission, still hopping pathogenically from animals to homo sapiens may or may not still be hopping from person to person, pathogenic or not, uh, may or may not still be hopping from people to animals. Uh, It's to be remembered that everything, including homo sapiens, creationists notwithstanding, arose from animals. Well, that's, okay. that's not really true. Well, no, viruses didn't arise from animals. No, I mean, things way, there were things way before animals. Yes, but I, I take the point that... that okay. Yeah. We had a discussion about what is a zoonotic or a zoonosis. And, and aren't all right? diseases ultimately zoonotic because yeah. before we were people, we were animals, and so all of our diseases so came from... So he said this is, they came from, people, from animals once upon a time, but not the ones that came into people and were not pathogenic right. and later became... Right, so a distinction between... yeah. Would, is that okay with you? Would yeah, you buy that? okay. All right. Uh, and then the next email from Joe is on the same topic, a follow-up to Vince's suggestion that all viruses are zoonoses. So that's what I say. I think all viruses that we have are zoonoses. They came from animals. But as you heard, maybe that's not true. But we make these definitions up anyway. What's the difference? We cannot assume it is the case for all. Could there not be some viruses that have joined us for the evolutionary journey from primates to people. We as a species did not appear as fully formed humans one day, naive to all the sniffles and sneezes, only to be colonized as time went on, unless you subscribe to creationism. As animals, we evolved from other animals and inevitably carried some viral baggage along the way. Thanks again for your time, effort, and attempts at humor. Ouch. <laughs> I, I, this has been bugging Joe, me. that's harsh. Attempts, you know, Joe is from London, that's why. <laughs> that's why, it gets it. So could not some virus have joined us? I, sure, but they would, I think all the viruses that we know now, the seven classes of genome, they think, I think they, they arose a long time ago, and there is evolutionary evidence right. for this. Right, but some of, them, right. some of them have been with us since before we were homo sapiens, and some have come come in more recently. Yes, that's fine. So I, I think I, zoonotic I think okay. should be reserved for something that came into humans after we were clearly 
humans. A distinct okay, species. That's fine. No problem there. Oh, here, take the next one, Alan. You can answer. Oh, yeah, I can answer this. <laughs> Catherine writes, why do bats seem to be such a good mixing bowl for viruses? Good question. <laughs> Nobody knows. And like, some, like so many questions in science, the short ones are the really tough ones. I think they have great immune systems. Well, according to Dixon, bats, make, uh, bats are one half or one third or one sixth or one tenth of all mammals, depending on which day you ask him. 20%. 20 percent, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's the, there's a tremendous genetic diversity in that, um, what is it, is it an order? Don't know. Uh, Chiroptera. Order, order family. Chiroptera. Chiroptera. Yeah. Okay. That yeah. mm -hmm. That's an order. It's an order. Um, I may have just made a biology professor at college very proud. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, um, yeah. I, so it's a, it's a very diverse order, um, and I, I think probably that genetic diversity gives a lot of mammalian viruses. And being mammals, we're probably more susceptible to viruses from bats than we would be from. I think diversity is part of it. They're very mobile. Uh, they're very yeah. social. They hang out and spread viruses among them. And I think their immune systems are unique, and people are just starting to study them. So there are some investigators that have established bat colonies. And, you have to uh, work at night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's part of it. I think their immune systems are probably unique. It would be really interesting to study bat innate immunity. Why don't you do that? There you go. Forget this translational stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. Uh, letter um, from Ryan, dear TWIV team. While this was a relatively small point in the context of your discussions of the hepasivirus, pegivirus discoveries discussed in the last podcast, by the way, that was in bats. They found hepasi and yes. pegiviruses, and hepasi is, of course, the, where, where uh, hepatitis C virus is in, in bats. Great study. Uh, you had discussed the conserved MIR-122 binding site of HCV and other hepasiviruses and how this may be linked to tissue tropism. In general, do viruses often take advantage of host microRNAs as an attribute of their pathogenesis? I realize that microRNAs play broad roles in antiviral defenses and countless other host pathways, and as such, I apologize if the question is itself too broad. Thanks for making the show and best wishes. So these bat hepasiviruses have the MIR-122 binding site. For those of you who don't know, hep C has a MIR-122 binding site in the 5'N, and it is required for replication. And it is probably what makes it liver-specific, because this is a liver-specific MIR-122. And these are present in the bat viruses as well. So absolutely, uh, Ryan, there are many examples of how um, viruses manipulate host microRNAs to their benefit. A picornavirus enterovirus 71 induces the synthesis of a cellular microRNA, which turns down a protein called EIF4E, the cap binding protein. And this shuts off host translation, and the virus doesn't need the cap, doesn't have one, so it doesn't need EIF4E. And that allows the virus to be preferentially translated. How cool is that, right? It induces this microRNA. So there are lots of other examples, and there's a great review article by Brian Cullen on this. And we'll put that in the show notes. Okay, our next part of TWIV and the last part are our science picks of the week. Jeff, do you want to make a pick? Uh, I might be greedy and take two if that's... You could take two. You could take two. You so take the first mine. was... <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, I was at the American Society for Virology meeting last week and was oh, fortunate Oh, you're going to pick my talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have three then. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was uh, happy to go to uh, Dr. Jonathan Udell gave a talk to uh, young scientists about the challenges of going forward in science and sort of what to expect. Uh, and they're very, very, his talk has been recorded. It's on YouTube from what I understand. Um, but my first exposure to it a couple of years ago was he wrote two uh, two-part review series in Nature Reviews of Molecular and Cell Biology. Uh, and I highly recommend those to any young scientist to read. They're a great short read, but they're sobering and uplifting at the same time. Uh, and they're I, probably one of the better things I've read during graduate school. They're very school. good. They're very yeah. good. I loved his talk. Did you remember he said that TWIV should get a Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. It was very cute. 
Uh, you want to skip, right? You don't want to do a pick? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give mine to Jeff. Tip? Okay. So um, my second pick is a student-run organization here at Harvard oh, that right. does similar things to This Week in Virology, where we try to make uh, bad science. Jo bad jokes? We do a lot of that, too. <laughs> Primarily me. Uh, <laughs> other people try to keep, take it a little bit more seriously. <laughs> Um, but it's an organization that tries to make science accessible to the public, uh, and it's a student organization called Science in the News. Uh, if you Google Harvard Science in the News, you will find the website. They're, they do a number of really great programs. They do public lectures that are recorded um, and put online free for anyone to watch. There's a biweekly newsletter called The Flash, where Harvard graduate students go over recent newsworthy things in uh, science and technology. Uh, and there's a number of great events in Boston. If anyone listening in Boston wants to attend, there's an events list that's always being updated. And it's a great way to get a small dose of science uh, at the general public understanding level. Great. Cool. Yes, yeah, so when I visited last time for the virology retreat, I learned of this program. Very nice. Uh, Alan, what do you have? Uh, I have um, another Harvard thing. This, this actually came up on my radar a little while ago. Um, and I hadn't gotten around to picking it. I said, oh, perfect. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is just, the, these images are absolutely gorgeous. This is a paper that came out in Science back in May. Um, it's a nanotechnology uh, Harvard engineering paper. Not really my field, but every now and then I'll look at one of these and say, wow, that is just so awesome. Uh, so what these folks did was, um, what appears to be a fairly simple chemical reaction, but in such a way with adjusting the, um, the pH and ion concentrations in the solution that it causes a precipitate to stack up and form these incredibly branched structures that look like flowers, except that they're, you know, really, really tiny. They've got scanning electron micrographs of them, which are false colored to, um, Oh wow! Just, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, they're just absolutely gorgeous. They look they look like they could be cake decorations or something. So um, so if you look at the show notes, that link will be up there to this this research. It's really it's really really gorgeous stuff, um, and it's scientifically interesting too that this fairly simple reaction is able to produce these complex structures, um, which could have a lot of uses. And uh, I I just found the pictures really cool too. And I'm a sucker for really cool pictures. And it was done here at Harvard. And it was done here at Harvard, so why not? Yeah, we're <laughs> making you people feel great. <laughs> uh, my pick. Because Harvard needs a self-esteem boost. Oh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> my pick is a website on Etsy called Scientific Culture. It's by Kate McCurrock. And she makes little uh, badges with sciencey things on them, lab, lab stuff and microbes and viruses. Um, and she writes in her profile, I build all my creations in my home in Victoria, BC. Uh, I graduated with a degree in cellular, molecular, mi microbial biology. I am overly enthused about everything science and love to spread my excitement through cute science crafts. So if translational research on HIV vaccines doesn't work out. <laughs> I'll have to craft a new career. Yes. There you <clears> go. <throat> it's really cute. Check it out. They're Maybe it'll push the right buttons. Very reasonably priced. I have to get some of these buttons. <laughs> they have a bacteriophage button. That's nice. There you go. Uh, we have a listener pick. This is great. This is from Basil, who writes, I don't think you can beat this for pick of the week. It's a video of NIH director. What's his name? I forgot. <laughs> Come on, guys. Francis What's Collins. It? Francis Collins. Francis Collins playing the sequester blues on guitar. <laughs> he sings and plays his guitar and he made a song called the sequester blues. And it is pretty cool. So check that out. I still don't think he's a great NIH director. <laughs> I'll have to cut that out. <laughs> Maybe I won't. Well, was your grant renewed? <laughs> yeah, but it got sequestered. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to keep it in. The heck with that. <laughs> so what have you got to lose? It. Really, nothing. I have TWIV. All right, that's TWIV 244. How many of you listen to TWIV in the audience, by the way? And about half of you don't. So check it out. It's cool. All right? You get good karma and you get a TWIV bump. Write us a letter and you get famous. Uh, TWIV is at TWIV. And these guys are going to have a successful HIV vaccine because of the TWIV bump. 
for Absolutely. Twiv. Absolutely. Twiv, we're at twiv.tv. We're also on iTunes. And if you like what we do, a uh, way you can help us is to go over to iTunes and just give us some stars or write a little review. And that helps to keep us uh, more visible on iTunes because we want a lot of people uh, to discover us. And we love getting your questions and comments. We, we can get them at twiv at twiv.tv. Dan Baruch is at the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research here at the Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having us. I really enjoyed our discussion. I think our listeners will too as well. And Jeff Teig Teigler, Teigler. Yep. <laughs> Teigler, Jeff Teigler is also at the same institution in, in Dan's lab where he is getting his PhD, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. Alan Dove can be found at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. And probably in a traffic jam on the, on the mass pipe shortly. I'm sorry. That's um, right. You could listen to TWIV. I could listen to TWIV on the, yes, I've, I've got, uh, got my phone Always nice me. to have you. My thanks to the CVVR. Oh, it's got my initials in the CVVR. <laughs> How cool is that? Thanks to CVVR. Thanks for inviting us. Sure. Appreciate it. We, uh, oh, before you conclude, it is, it's in the low 80s with uh, clear skies and, and it's you know, a nice day. A few puffy clouds. Nice we don't weather. have a window here to, to look out of, but nice I noticed weather. that on the way in. It's very um, nice. And I want to thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. You might want to know, what some, you know, Alan makes up the titles for most of the twibs. <laughs> Listen to this one, Crimson and Vectors. <laughs> Who likes crimson and vectors? All right, the other one is Park the Vax in Harvard Yard. <laughs> <laughs> I think they like that one better, don't they? Which one do you like, Dan? I like crimson and vectors. <laughs> sure, why not? Crimson Tide, not? right? Park the Vax in Harvard. Anyway, those, usually after we stop TWIV, we have a little discussion about um, I usually have more title ideas, but I, yeah, I was, what happened? I, I was rushing out of the house and just it, well, maybe on your ride home you could think. Maybe of some I'll come more. up with some. I, more. I do like some of those. Back and in the CVVR. Back in C the CVVR. Back in the CVVR. That's good. <laughs> that is great. We got a ringer in the audience. All right. Okay. Nice. Nice. I really like three that. pointer from the bleachers. Good. So, do you like back in the CVVR? I do. <laughs> could play the, we can have a little clip yeah, from the song. Yeah. I love that song. That is one of my favorite Beatles songs. I'm sorry, I digress. <laughs> I am Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twib is viral. <laughs> <laughs>